so I'll be talking about a new technique for uh, correcting aberrations uh, post-acquisition in broadband interferometric tomography. Now, the principles that I talk about here are generally applicable for broadband inter interferometric tomography, but I'll be giving specific examples uh, from OCT and interferometric synthetic aperture microscopy, or ISAM. Now, most of you are already... Yeah, go ahead. How's that? Is that better? Okay, thanks. It's kind of tangled up here right now. Uh, let me see. Let's see. Uh, well, you're not tethered to the desk. Yeah, that would be nice. Okay. Okay, great. Now, most of you uh, already know about OCT, but uh, as we go through the talk, I'll give some uh, background on ISAM as well. So, first of all, we'll, uh, we'll uh, look at why it's important to be able to correct for aberrations, and then give some examples of existing techniques, and then um, I'll present our new computational adaptive optics uh, technique uh, showing results in, in tissue phantoms and uh, biological tissue, and also go into the underlying theory and, and uh, data uh, processing. And then finally, I'll highlight some of our recent work uh, trying to do real-time uh, computed imaging to optimize resolution in uh, 3D data sets. So as most of us uh, know, aberrations uh, degrade resolution and contrast and signal in optical imaging. Uh, this is not just true in optical microscopy, but also in, in photography and uh, astronomy. Uh, from the ray optics point of view, this is because uh, all, the, all the rays do not focus, focus to a single point. From the more accurate uh, wave optics perspective, aberrations are deviations from ideal optical wavefronts that disrupt the constructive interference condition at the optical focus. Now, this results in a broadened point spread function with reduced peak intensity. Uh, the impact of aberrations is greater uh, as you go to higher and higher in numerical aperture and also as you go to imaging deeper and deeper in tissues. So ISAM is a... Um, you see, this movie is... ISAM is a, a computed imaging technique that overcomes the depth of field problem in OCT. Now, it utilizes a Fourier domain resampling scheme that's previously uh, used in synthetic aperture radar to correct defocus throughout uh, an entire 3D volume. Now, early work was done at fairly low numerical aperture, but we've seen that even with moderate increases in numerical aperture, the effects of aberrations can be significant, particularly when you're trying to uh, do reconstructions far away uh, from focus. Now, in ISAM, since we're trying to combine higher in AOCT, deep tissue imaging, and far from focus reconstruction, uh, the ability to correct for aberrations then is important. So traditionally, uh, aberrations are corrected through the use of a sophisticated optical design, such as an, a microscope objective with an aberration correction collar. Now this actually optimizes the correction for a given depth in the sample. Uh, however, in OCT and ISAM, we're interested in optimal resolution throughout a 3D volume. Another technique, adaptive optics, utilizes a deformable mirror to dynamically modify the phase profile of the objective lens pupil. Now, um, in addition to utilizing uh, sort of uh, complicated and expensive optical hardware, it's not generally applicable. Uh, for instance, it's incompatible, for, uh, incompatible with catheter or needle-based OCT systems, both of which are known to suffer from problems with astigmatism. 
With this class of techniques, uh, the aberration correction is fixed at the time of imaging. If you have access to the amplitude and phase of the light, on the other hand, aberration correction can be done after the data has been acquired. Uh, this has been shown in uh, digital holographic microscopy, including for thin biological samples, such as a single cell. However, in OCT and ISAM, we're primarily interested in imaging uh, bulk biological tissues. Now, an OCT system can be thought of as a broadband DHM system. Uh, but the scan acquisition with the focus beam and confocal detection actually has uh, important advantages for imaging and scattering tissue, such as uh, reduced in-plane crosstalk uh, with that, that's typical of uh, spatially coherent full-field illumination. Uh, and secondly, uh, confocal rejection of outer plane multiple scattering. So here's a schematic of the speckle domain OCT systems used in this study. Um, you, most of you have already seen this uh, or a similar schematic from your OCT lab notes. Um, the thing I would like to point out is that in order to clearly demonstrate uh, computational AO, we have uh, deliberately introduced uh, the cylindrical lenses into the sample arm uh, to introduce astigmatism. Now, astigmatism is actually quite a common aberration in the human eyes, so this is quite relevant for uh, high resolution uh, retinal OCT, for example. So astigmatism is actually characterized uh, by these well-known uh, line foci, which are axially separated. And uh, midway in between, uh, the, the plane is often referred to as the, the plane of least uh, confusion. Now, I just want to point out that uh, the, the sample arm here is, is relatively uh, simple. And by way of comparison, uh, here, this here is the sample arm of an adaptive optics OCT system. Um, the, the, uh, the planes here marked by P actually uh, represent, uh, they actually image the pupil to multiple points along the optical system. And in particular, uh, these uh, deformable mirrors and uh, wavefront sensor uh, require this, this kind of uh, optical image of the pupil. So the, the additional hardware here, I should point out, is, is actually reasonably expensive. It could be anywhere between $50,000 and $100,000. This particular setup uses two deformable mirrors to uh, get extra wavefront uh, shaping flexibility. But uh, this is really a major impediment to, uh, to uh, commercial OCT systems, as none of them uh, actually can afford to, to, uh, to have hardware-based um, adaptive optics. So let's jump uh, straight into some results. Uh, here we can see uh, measurements in a silicone phantom consisting of uh, microparticles throughout the 3D volume. So in the on pass OCT, we can see the two um, line foci planes, which are sort of uh, typical of astigmatism. And midway in between, uh, we can identify this plane of uh, least confusion. So if we now apply computational AO, uh, we can see that the plane of least confusion is now restored as the focal plane. <laughs> and the planes uh, previously showing line foci now show uh, Gaussian-like wind spread functions. So now we can apply ISAM to remove defocus uh, throughout this entire volume, which spans more than uh, 30 Rayleigh ranges uh, to get a high resolution uh, reconstruction of that volume. So let's uh, try and quantify this uh, a little bit further. Uh, here we can see that uh, aberration corrected OCT uh, shows Gaussian-like resolution. Uh, the aberration corrected ISAM shows uh, spatially invariant resolution uh, that's available at the aberration corrected focus. And for comparison, we also plot here the uh, the ISAM resolution uh, when imaging with a standard Gaussian beam. And you can see uh, these two curves are fairly similar. So on the right, we show the depth-dependent uh, signal-to-noise ratio. And once again, we're, we're comparing um, 
This is after ISAM reconstruction. Uh, we're comparing uh, the single Gaussian beam focus in blue uh, to the uh, dual line or astigmatic optical system after aberration correction and ISAM. So you can see here that uh, the astigmatic optical system uh, provides a much flatter depth dependent response. The signal to noise ratio at the focus is, is reduced, but interestingly, when we go deep in the sample, uh, the SNR for the astigmatic system is, is actually boosted. So this can be um, explained by preferential light collection from the two line confocal gates. And uh, it actually raises a very interesting prospect for high NA tomography. If there is no resolution penalty associated with aberrations, then it may actually be ben or preferable to image with an aberrated optical system, uh, at least from a signal collection point of view. So what are the underlying principles here? Hardware-based AO physically modifies the phase profile of the objective lens pupil. In computational AO, we numerically modify the phase of a virtual or computed pupil. This is based on the Fourier optics result that the pupil is actually a bandpass filter whose transfer function under a, a trivial coordinate scaling is given by the, the Fourier transform of the point spread function uh, at the optical focus. So the significance of this result is that uh, previously used uh, pupil correction strategies in hardware-based adaptive optics are applicable here as well. But there is a subtlety to account for, and uh, that is that the, the OCT point spread function is actually the square of the optical beam. This is a direct square, and so the point spread function is still complex. So uh, we can now invoke the, uh, well, under the assumption of depth and variance, and we'll, we'll return to this a bit later, uh, we can invoke the convolution theorem and utilize the Fourier optics result to express the, the transverse bandwidth of the point spread function uh, as a convolution of the pupil functions. This allows us now to uh, define this uh, aberration phase filter and write the uh, signal model uh, in such a way where the contribution from aberrations is included as an extra filtering step. So, um, ISAM is based on the fact that <laughs> defocus in the spatial domain manifests as a coordinate warping in the Fourier domain. Uh, here we have the ISAM signal model, which relates the 3D Fourier transform of the OCT tomogram to the 3D Fourier transform of the object structure, where the coordinate warping, or in other words, the mapping from K to QZ, is uh, given by the ISAM resampling curves, uh, and it, one example of which is shown uh, as this black line here. Now, uh, mo most of you having done the OCT lab will would have uh, seen how uh, resampling of raw spectral domain OCT data uh, so that it was linear in K uh, produced uh, much better axial resolution for all depths simultaneously. Now, in much the same way, uh, we, can, we can understand the ISAM resampling of the Fourier space, except now we're um, uh, recovering uh, constructive interference across the transverse bandwidth, uh, but this happens for all depths simultaneously. So aberrations, uh, we saw, could be uh, represented as an extra filtering step, and so they uh, actually disrupt the expected phase profile in the Fourier domain. However, the aberration phase filter effects can be essentially deconvolved to give us the, uh, the phase profile that we do expect. Now, if we I remember, we made the assumption of uh, depth invariance, uh, but nonetheless, uh, the, the uh, effects of aberrations can be broken into and corrected uh, separately, broken into space variant and space invariant uh, uh, contributions. So now you can imagine that uh, as a given scatter is, is, is being measured, in order for it to give a predictable, predictable phase profile, 
in the Fourier domain, uh, this actually comes with some uh, restrictions on the phase stability. And so, um, so this predictable phase profile is actually needed during the interrogation time of that scatterer, which uh, depends on the beam width, or how far away from uh, focus it is, uh, as well as the transverse uh, beam scanning speed. Now what this means is that uh, the reconstruction is more robust near the focus. And so if you're trying to do far from focus reconstructions uh, with ISAM, that requires greater phase stability than if you're just simply trying to uh, do computational AO near the beam focus. So there are actually uh, these three main methods by which we can achieve uh, phase stable uh, data, data sets. And the first is uh, high speed data acquisition. Now early work, early ISAM work was done at relatively slow frame rates of you know, a few frames a second, but uh, now we're, we're you know, up to 150 frames a second using a, a 92 kilohertz A scan rate. So even still, um, the residual uh, phase noise can be corrected um, by these two classes of, uh, of uh, processing. And the first is corrects axial phase fluctuations, and uh, this can be achieved by using a phase reference, which is in contact with the sample. And, this, and secondly, we can also correct uh, transverse shifts uh, between frames. So here we are showing some uh, axial phase correction in the top here. These are cross-sectional images of a, a cover slip interface uh, before and after phase correction. And uh, here we're showing on fast images. Um, these, this is from a, a phantom sample consisting of these uh, microparticles, and, and once again before and after phase correction. The frame rate is, is pretty slow, um, and I should say that once we go to much higher acquisition speeds, things become a lot more stable. So the uh, standard way of describing aberrations of the pupil is through the use of uh, Zernike polynomials. And so the actual pupil phase can be expressed as a superposition of these Zernike polynomials, um, which actually form an orthonormal basis on the unit circle. And the nice thing is that they have, uh, depending on what the polynomial order is, they have very nice uh, correspondence to, to well-known aber aberrations. And so what we'll, the ones that we'll mainly be looking at in this talk are uh, defocus, astigmatism, and uh, primary uh, spherical aberration. So let's put that to, to work now. And here we actually are showing uh, optimization of the uh, pupil correction. Uh, and, and we're actually utilizing feedback from image metrics. So this, um, from, uh, from analogy with hardware-based adaptive optics, can be referred to as sensorless computational AO. So the image metrics were calculated uh, using data from the plane of least confusion, uh, the amplitude and phase of which is shown in the middle. Uh, the data from the two line foci are shown in the top and bottom uh, rows. And the pupil phase is shown here in the middle. So uh, in this first step, let's utilize the Zernike polynomial for correcting astigmatism at 45 degrees. And so note the, uh, the change in both the amplitude and the phase. And now let's uh, correct astigmatism at 0 degrees. And you can see now that the uh, plane of least confusion clearly emerges as the focal plane. Uh, let's, we can now slightly improve the resolution of the focal plane by correcting a cortic spherical aberration. Now in this step, let's shift the focus to the upper plane. So the image metrics plummet because uh, the plane of least confusion now has experienced defocus. Um, but an important thing to note here is that this highlights a difference between refocusing and ISAM. A given value of defocus is optimal for a single plane only, whereas the ISAM resampling uh, corrects defocus for all uh, planes, all depths simultaneously. So finally, let's uh, return the focus to the focal plane. So here we show uh, computational AO in rat lung tissue. Um, below these 3D volumes are three on fast uh, depths. And uh, as you can see, uh, 
the aberration corrected ISAM uh, corrects both for astigmatism and for uh, defocus. And clearly, it provides the best uh, resolution contrast and signal to noise ratio. If we just try uh, ISAM directly without doing aberration correction, uh, this is what we get. And uh, what this tells us is that when aberrations are present, um, they really must be accounted for in the reconstruction in order to get the best resolution. So here are some more results. Um, this time it's from the 1300 nanometer system um, and in rabbit muscle tissue. And it's, com it's comparing uh, standard and aberration corrected OCT to standard and aberration corrected ISAM. Once again, you can see the presence of uh, the astigmatism, which is the axis of which is approximately aligned to these uh, muscle fiber bundles. Now, the ISAM clearly shows not just the best resolution, uh, but also uh, superior signal-to-noise ratio. This image is actually dark because uh, the dynamic range in the image is significantly greater than that of the other three images. So let's actually scan deeper. Okay, so now, uh, once again, we can see that um, uh, the aberration-corrected ISAM uh, provides the best uh, resolution, and in particular, uh, we can notice this delineation between the muscle fiber bundles that is only uh, visualized in this image but, and can't be seen in the other three uh, images. So let's scan even deeper still. And okay, so now uh, we can see uh, some, some structure which is orthogonal to that uh, axis of astigmatism and uh, once again uh, you need to have this aberration correction to provide the uh, optimal uh, definition and contrast of that fine tissue structure. And finally, let's uh, scan a lot deeper. As we're going deeper, you'll notice that the quality of the images and, and certainly the resolution is degrading. So this actually raises a very interesting question. Uh, as why is the resolution getting worse as we go deeper? Um, the signal-to-noise ratio is still reasonably high, and um, the, the, the interesting question is, is it the tissue-induced aberrations that are limiting? And uh, for the moment, this is still an interesting question, but uh, certainly uh, we're very interested to see uh, you know, whether we can Im improve upon uh, the resolution as we get deeper. So here we show that, uh, that you, that uh, ISAM can be done in real time uh, for high-speed volumetric imaging. And these are two on-fast planes taken from a reconstructed volume that spans more than uh, 40 Rayleigh ranges. Now, our uh, processing of this data is really uh, limited by the data acquisition speed. Um, and, uh, and certainly, we're hoping that uh, we, we, we will also be able to combine well, this, this volumetric ISAM with computational AO and be able to provide the best, uh, the best uh, images and 3D data sets uh, in real time. So in summary, uh, we've shown a new computational AO method which can be retrospectively applied to existing OCT data sets that are approximately phase stable. Uh, Hardware-based AO and computational AO both modify pupil functions. And this allows us to tap into existing strategies for pupil correction. Now, traditionally, aberrations uh, have, shall we say, a bad reputation. Uh, but we've seen at least one example where uh, imaging with an aberrated optical system may be preferable. And what this means is that the optical system can now be uh, designed to optimize signal rather than minimizing aberrations. So in future, it will be interesting to look at the depth-dependent effects of aberrations. And certainly, this ties also into the question of uh, what is limiting uh, the imaging depth in scattering tissue. Is it multiple scattering aberrations or SNR? I guess ultimately, SNR will be limiting. But there may be some intermediate re region where aberration correction may help. And uh, we're also you know, certainly uh, very interested in, in, in being able to provide uh, optimal resolution throughout a 3D volume in real time uh, so that it could be used for real time medical diagnostics. 
Uh, and then finally, um, this is a very interesting and upcoming area in optical imaging. Um, instead of using a deformable mirror, if you now use an SLM, you have access to many, many uh, elements in, in the, uh, to, to do um, uh, wavefront shaping of the pupil. And certainly this is um, uh, sort of opening the way to some very interesting work. Now in our computed pupil, we have access to you know, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 6 elements, which can be independently uh, adjusted at will. So uh, it will be really interesting to investigate this perfect focusing uh, for interferometric tomography in disordered biological tissues. So with that, I'd like to close by uh, acknowledging the, the people who have contributed to this, uh, to this work. And I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Stephen, for a very nice presentation. Please. Can you really understand when the reconstruction process is applied to the Zurich? Right, okay, so let me. Uh, so that was actually uh, immediately before ISAM. So I, I, think, I think, let me just go back to the, to the slide that you're referring to. Yeah. So the Zernica polynomials uh, were applied uh, in, in this step here um, for, the, for correcting the three aberrations in the 3D, uh, 3D data set. But the movies that I showed of the Phantom, they were actually for specific on-class planes. And so actually, in, in particular, uh, in, at, this, at this place there in, in the process. Yeah. So after taking the transverse Fourier transform, so right now we're in the transverse Fourier domain, which is you know, connected to the pupil function. And so then we modify uh, this pupil function using the Zernica polynomials. Okay, so you don't have any Yeah, I, I should have said as, as well that uh, we're pretty much using a phase, uh, phase only aberration correction filter. Yeah. I think the question is, is there any regularization involved? Yeah, so there's no amplitude shaping of the, the Fourier domain data. All right, other questions? Just on a similar note, just a quick back presentation question. Um, so when you apply these different polynomials, you have to know a priori what kind of aberrations you're expecting to correct, or is there some optimization that, that automatically leads to that? Yeah, that's, that, that's a good question. Um, in our case, we knew what aberrations we had to correct. Um, but in general, um, I think the sort of strategies that have already been employed in hardware-based adaptive optics can be used here. So you, you would, for instance, start out by trying to just correct the focus first, optimize that, and then move on to the higher order aberrations um, in, in turn, yeah. And so if you have some complex biological sample, do you like put spheres in ahead of time to see how they change and that could be an idea that, say, for an unknown system? Yeah, I mean, that's certainly something that uh, you know we've considered doing to be able to put in these little guide stars to uh, you know, tell us what the aberrations are. Uh, but uh, the other approach is to use these image metrics as well. So, and I didn't quite go into the details here, but um, uh, these image metrics essentially try to maximize, the first one tries to maximize the uh, high frequency content that's within the, the bandwidth of the signal. And uh, the second one makes the assumption that when you correct aberrations, you're getting uh, constructive interference across the transverse bandwidth, and so the peak signals actually increase. So this actually provides feedback on how well uh, w the tweaking of the aberration correction is working. Um, right, so that is... Um, it's more of a, I would say, a redistribution of signal. Um, so certainly you are, you're, well, there's, there's a significant loss there. Um, but then again, SNR is really high at the focus. And so uh, the, the sort of benefit here is that 
when you get deeper in the sample, you tend, you tend to boost the, uh, the signal when you have an astigmatic optical system. But the basic Right. Well, in, in, in our case, we're not actually using any uh, hardware-based wavefront shaping. Um, and I should say that when we do the reconstruction, uh, you're actually, because of your uh, recovering constructive interference, you're, you're, you're improving the signal-to-noise ratio compared to the average case. Other question? Not let's think our figure one more time. 